people get upset with me because I bring in religious themes, but I understand some things about mythology and religion. And it's not an accident that the axiomatic Western individual is someone who was unfairly nailed to a cross and tortured. It's like, yes, <laughs> right, exactly. So what do you do about that? Pick up your damn suffering and bear it and try to be a good person so you don't make it worse. What's up everyone? In today's video, I'm going to be reviewing and breaking down one of my favorite Jordan Peterson clips currently on YouTube. There are so many different ideas and topics he gets into here and I thought it would be a great idea to explore some of them for your benefit and obviously mine. Stick around. <music> So Jordan Peterson is a intellect, he is a, an author, a philosopher, and a psychologist. He was also a professor at the University of Toronto and is now considered to be a public intellectual. And he rose to fame because he stood up for what he believed were impositions on free speech in a bill in Canada known as Bill C-16. The reason why I love Jordan Peterson, however, isn't so much to do with his politics or specific values, but of the psychological significance of mythological and religious stories and the way he sees that as ways to act within the world. I read a lot about the terrible things that people have done to each other. You just cannot even imagine it. It's so awful. So you don't want to be someone like that. Now, do you have a reason to be? Yes. You have a lots of reasons to be. God, there's reasons to be resentful about your existence. Everyone you know is going to die. You know, you too. And there's going to be a fair bit of pain along the way. And lots of it's going to be unfair. It's like, yeah, no wonder you're resentful. It's like, act it out and see what happens. You make everything you're complaining about infinitely worse. One of the first things you'll notice is that Mr. I should say Dr. Dr. Jordan Peterson is strikingly blunt. And I think... He's one of the few now that are both highly intellectual and also strikingly blunt. And it's a very reassuring wave of loveliness in today's politically correct world. I haven't seen too many people out there that are both strikingly blunt, but also have the wisdom and the intellect to back it up. And I, it's one of the first things I really liked about Jordan Peterson. It's like you can tell he's someone who really has thought things through for a very long time. And in his case, he, the first book that he wrote was called Maps for Meaning. Here it is right here. And he apparently took 15 years to write this thing. When I was reading it, it took me probably about six months to read and fully comprehend. There are loads and loads and loads of notes throughout this thing because it's so bloody hard to understand. And I often found myself Googling ideas that didn't make any sense to me, trying to understand his vocabulary, which also didn't make any sense to me, trying to come to understand the ideas that he was talking about because they were often rooted in deeper ideas that I had to learn and then deeper ideas still. There's this idea that hell is a bottomless pit and that's because no matter how bad it is, some stupid son of a bitch like you could figure out a way to make it a lot worse. <laughs> so you think, well, what do you do about that? Well, you accept it. That's what life is like. It's suffering. That's what the religious people have always said. Life is suffering. Yes. Well, who wants to admit that? Well, just think about it. Well, so what do you do in the face of that suffering? Try to reduce it. Start with yourself. What good are you? Get yourself together for Christ's sake so that when your father dies, you're not whining away in a corner and you can help plan the funeral and you can stand up solidly so that people can rely on you. That's better. Don't be a damn victim. Of course you're a victim. Jesus, obviously. The first noble truth of Buddhism is that life is suffering. And when I was reading a hell of a lot of Alan Watts, one of the things that Watts used to talk about was that the noble truth of Buddhism isn't just life is suffering, it's that the way humans tend to experience life is, is grounded in suffering. But life actually is ambivalent. Life is just life. It's how we perceive life and how we interact with life that makes it either good or bad because obviously morality is something that is entrenched within us. When I was in my early 20s, I had a really tough time dealing with the idea of death and I eventually developed obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, believing that I would somehow go to hell and be eternally damned. And that forced me to want to pick up rubbish, to 
prove to myself and prove to God, and I had a Catholic upbringing, that, uh, that I was somewhat of a good Samaritan. And one of the reasons why I was so drawn to Jordan Peterson when I first heard about him and first heard him talk was because he was discussing these very, very deep ideas that are often neglected or disregarded to make way for perhaps more superficial things that are going on in the world in this day and age. So he normalizes the idea that life is suffering. And I think that's a brilliant thing to do. You will die. I will die. Everyone I have never known will die and there'll be a hell of a lot of pain psychologically and physically within that. That's just the truth. Unfortunately, the only other thing that is true of life or absolutely inevitable is the fact that we will all have to pay taxes. So what Jordan Peterson does is he looks at life from a bottom up approach. I was born into a world that was obsessed with this idea of pursuing happiness. I'm very grateful for that. However, it left me somewhat psychologically ignorant. It was harder for me to expand my horizons and look into my anxieties and come to greater knowing because I thought that anything short of happiness was some kind of moral failure on my position. So here when I have a doctor of psychology talk about the fact that life is going to be fundamentally suffering and that happiness is uh, is something to be very grateful for. You can imagine how, how much I gravitated towards that idea because it felt like I could finally take the pressure off and, uh, and, and, and release myself from the shackles that I'd been bound to unconsciously for much of my upbringing. Now that's obviously no one's fault, but it was part of my growth and development into becoming an adult and Jordan Peterson really helped me with that. I think it's incredible that he says these kinds of words, nihilism, depression, anxiety, as though they're, they're, they're a given and they're not actually the exception. We live in a day and age now where mental health is on the rise, suicide rates are on the rise, more and more people are becoming addicted to prescription medication, especially in the US. And for someone to come along and say, the reasons aren't because you have a an individual problem, it's actually because life itself is tremendously difficult and there's a hell of a lot of suffering that goes along with it. Is a real kind of, thanks man. No worries, man. Put yourself together. And then maybe if you put yourself together, you know how to do that. You know what's wrong with you, if you'll admit it. You know there's a few things you could like polish up a little bit that you might even be able to manage in your insufficient present condition. And so you might shine yourself up a little bit and then your eyes will be a little more open. Then you can shine yourself up a little bit more and then maybe you could bring your family together instead of having them be the hateful, spiteful, neurotic, infighting batch that you're like doomed to spend Christmas with. Jordan Peterson cops it a little bit, I'd say, for his perceived lack of compassion. But one of the things I think he's given a lot of thought to is the idea behind compassion. Chapter two in 12 Rules for Life is called Treat Yourself Like Someone You're Responsible for Helping. And I remember reading it and thinking, geez, I don't think I've ever kind of done that. We're so naturally altruistic and self-sacrificing when when other people are, are in our midst and he wrote about the fact that there was a there was a study done uh, about how we give antibiotics to our pets and I think it was specifically dogs and he compared that to how we give ourselves antibiotics when we need to take antibiotics and I think from memory the scientific study suggested that more people on the whole tend to finish the antibiotic dose when administering it to their dogs as opposed to themselves. So we have this natural proclivity to neglect our own well-being. So Jordan Peterson is saying, treat yourself like your dog, treat yourself like someone you're responsible for helping. And that will make you tend to things that actually reduce the amount of suffering in your life that overall leads to a better outcome. And I think that was a brilliant idea. I loved reading that chapter when I did. The thing about compassion is it's not sufficient to produce solutions. Compassion is an unbelievably useful emotion if you're dealing with six month old infants. And it's a good point too. Compassion in and of itself is void of solutions. It's one thing to be caring for someone and look out for them, but it's another to actually provide them with a path forward so they can do it themselves. How do you overcome the suffering of life? Is be a better person. That's how you do it. Well, that's hard. It takes responsibility. And I think, you know, if you said to someone, you want to have a meaningful life? Everything you do matters. That's the definition of a meaningful life. But everything you do matters. So you're going to have to carry that with you. Or do you want to just forget about the whole meaning thing and 
then you don't have any responsibility because who the hell cares and you can wander through life doing whatever you want gratifying impulsive desires for how useful that's going to be and you're stuck in meaninglessness but you don't have any responsibility which one do you want? well, ask yourself which one are you pursuing? and you'll find very rapidly that it isn't the majority of your soul that's pursuing the whole meaning thing because, well look what you have to do to do that you have to take on the fact that life is suffering you have to put yourself together in the face of that well that's hard Christ, it's amazing, people can even do it I'm stunned every day when I go outside and it isn't a, r a riot with everything burning. So here's where the clip starts to get really interesting and he lays out that path that we were just speaking about. He starts to tell us, okay, given that life is fundamentally painful and, and in his, is absolutely ripe with suffering, what do we do about it? Well, one of the first things, and this is why he became so well known, was he told us to clean our rooms. The next thing beyond that was looking at little things around the house that we could do. And I believe that one of the chapters or at least ideas in, in his next book coming up is, is, is trying to make one room in your house absolutely immaculate and as best it possibly can be. I found in my own life that confidence is, is earned. It's, it's not a given. And I feel good about myself when I achieve difficult tasks. Like when I finish writing a book and I put the laptop down that final time, I really feel really quite good about myself, even when I finish a video too. So I recognize that when I do things that are difficult, I do them not because I want to be some kind of, oh, look at me, I'm just doing the hard yards, but because I selfishly want to feel that kind of dopamine squirt at the end of the day. And I think we all deserve that as well. We deserve to feel good about ourselves. We deserve to feel good about our lives. And the dichotomy of selfishness in this regard is that the more selfish we are in doing difficult things around the house, provided it's not just to use one of Jordan Peterson's words, malevolent, is that it actually helps other people as well. If I clean my own room up or if I clean your room, we're both going to be happy about that. So I'm going to get the dopamine squirt and you might get the oxytocin squirt. There's all these ruined people out there, they've got problems like you can't believe. Off they go to work and do things they don't even like and look, the lights are on. My God, it's <laughs> unbelievable. It's, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And we're so ungrateful. Another thing that really helped Jordan Peterson's rise to fame, I think, was his absolute obsession with capital R responsibility. He believes that the more responsibility you have in your life, the more meaning you have in your life, and that ultimately what we want is to live a meaningful life, not necessarily a happy life. I was listening to him give a lecture at the University of Toronto in one of his Maps for Meaning classes, and he was saying that if you're trying to live a happy life, what's going to happen the first time you have a fight with your spouse? What's going to happen the first time things don't go your way? The multitude of things that we can't control that don't give us what we want, how are we going to deal with that? It got me thinking about all the times I'd perhaps removed myself from uncomfortable situations because I was unconsciously obsessed with this idea of trying to be happy all the time. I quickly came to realize that happiness is very much transient. If I put myself in a similar situation now, if I'm hungry, to me, what would make me happy right now is a big toasted sandwich. As soon as I finish that toasted sandwich, I know that the next thing that's going to make me happy is a glass of water. So happiness is something that is always just outside my reach like a dangling carrot. And what I want to do is be happy in the present moment. If that's the case with you, Jordan Peterson's advice is to try to acquire some responsibility in your life because the more meaning your life has, the more people are going to rely on you, the harder it is for you, but the more meaning there is in your life. And that meaning is actually something that sustains you. Viktor Frankl, the 20th century existentialist and uh, founder of Logotherapy said a similar thing. He said that happiness is something that ensues as a result of moving towards a higher goal or a, or a vision for ourselves. It's not necessarily something that just happens to us. And I found all these ideas very profound and they're absolutely ubiquitous in Jordan Peterson's writings and his online lectures too. It's an old, 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 old idea. It's far older than Christianity. It's old. It's the oldest story of mankind. Get yourself together. Transcend your suffering. See if you can be some kind of hero. Make the suffering in the world less. Well, that's the way forward, as far as I can tell, if there is any way forward. Finally, he finishes the clip with a reference to the 
Joseph Campbell, Hero's Journey. And Joseph Campbell was very much influenced by Carl Jung's idea of individuation and the alchemical idea of what you want the most will be found where you least want to look. And I believe the Latin for that is in Sterculinus Invinitor. This gives us a sense of autonomy over our lives and this idea that we can transcend ourselves and be more and do more, provided that we are courageous enough to face our fears. One of the reasons why Jordan Peterson believes that the hero's journey is so incredibly profound is not only because it is the one myth, the monomyth, that is entrenched in all of the religious stories, but it's actually entrenched within our biology. And this is something that he wrote about in his first book, Maps for Meaning. He said that we have been watching ourselves act over time and telling stories about how we act over time. And the more courageous we are, both as individuals and societies, the better we'll be as a society in and of itself. So these are just some of the reasons why I have been deeply blessed to have found Jordan Peterson on YouTube, why I love his books, and why I think his fundamental philosophical ideas are really, really important for all of us in the 21st century. What are some of his ideas that you deeply vibed with when you first came across them? Do you like his ideas of the hero's journey? Do you like the idea that responsibility engenders meaning and that meaning is actually what we want to be chasing, not happiness? Leave a comment in the comment section below. And guys, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. I love making this kind of content and want to keep opening up the floor for or deeper philosophical discussions because I believe talking about ideas is the best way to grow and learn not only as individuals but as societies and collectives on the whole. Thank you very much. See you next time.